We're still, by, by the way, on section one. <laughs> That's why we couldn't do all 48. I mean, all. That's why there's reincarnation. <laughs> Which is really just another form of insanity. Hmm? I mean, who would, who, who really wants to keep doing this over? <laughs> yeah. It's really true. I mean, after a while, you just, you know, the, the body is kind of a heavy thing to be carrying around all the time. It's like, you know, you ever feel that? That you just wouldn't just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course it's... Even a light, even light bodies are heavy. Yeah, because there's this sense of being caught in it or trapped in it or... You, know, you can't like get really beyond it, which is one of the things that's sort of nice about spirit. We don't see spirit doesn't have that kind of a limit limitation, right? It's really the a connection that, that transcends any kind of limitation at all. No boundaries. It's not like there's a boundary. A boundary would be something that would be outside you. So what if it, the mind doesn't have a boundary? That's a that's a very important point. I mean, the mind just goes. Right? The mind, mind is forever. It's very hard for us to understand how that's true because we're so attracted to the world and, and to the, the, the definition of form within the context of the world. But the, the <clears throat> everyone, remember the line from the Course, everyone already knows. Well, everyone ever, already knows that this isn't it and that, that this is a, a limitation in form. We feel it. Lily cats, well you can't talk lily cats without this microphone. Is it on? I turned it off for the break. Alright, turn it back on. Okay. Okay, um, I was just going to say I had this experience when I was a little kid that um, my father was telling me about outer space and that outer space goes on forever and ever and there's like no, there's no end to it and that concept just seemed so uh, it was space. like, but there has to be an end. Like, there's an end to everything. Mm -hmm. you know, where, where would the end be? Right. And so if I thought about it long enough, I was going, you know, going crazy. But it was like, <laughs> well, if you get to an end, then then what's on the other side of the end, right? I mean, like you you run up against a a, a gigantic brick. I enjoy the, the Cosmos series on uh, the universe, how the universe works series on. Well, not just Carl Sagan, but there's another series now that's called How the Universe Works. That's just, uh, I've been watching that, uh, recording it, and why it's just so uh, absolutely phenomenal in terms of when you start talking about a sun that's a billion times the size of our sun. What? 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 How? A billion times? How could a sun be billion? I mean, it just. <laughs> and, and, and all these different dimensions of things that just, it don't make sense. Uh, <laughs> but but it's still form. That's the point. And the, what the Course is saying, that, but that's not what reality is. Reality is not a matter of form. Which is, but we know that because we know that love is real. And love does not have a form. And mind does not have a form. It's not limited to a brain. A brain is just a mechanism. And there are other truth doesn't have a form. Knowledge doesn't have a form. Heaven doesn't have a form. Heaven, uh, as Anita Morjani said in her book, is a, is a state of being. And she says, and I was now in that state. So a state is a different, it's not a place. You know, it's not one of the states. <laughs> it's, it's a kind of be, a beingness. And, and that's what we are. God does now have a form in, in that sense, right? But, and then, but God is the reality. Heaven's reality, truth's reality, knowledge is reality, and that's the thing that we really, that we really long for. But while well, we're here, and and while we're here, <clears throat> then what we really want to do is learn about this or find out about it to the point where we can literally go home. That's how we have all these religions. I mean, all the religions are struggling, but then they get trapped themselves. They get trapped into some kind of a form, rules, rituals, creeds, you know. And then the moment you do that, 
you, you just created another box to put yourself in. And boxes are, are, are limitations in form. So let's look on the top of 10. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit takes you gently by the hand and retraces with you your mad journey outside yourself. And it is a mad journey outside ourselves. <clears throat> and this is a mad journey into to being lost. If you look at, again, the prodigal son story, he, he, wants to, he wants to go off and to do this thing, but as it turns out, it's kind of a mad journey outside himself. And even, you know, the, the, insofar as he goes out there and has some sort of success, builds a kingdom, <laughs> then they build a kingdom, and that's, that's insanity too, because it's just a, a kingdom. But it's a, it's a kingdom that has a, a form and a definition and an end. All kingdoms end, right? Your mad journey outside yourself, leading you gently back to the truth and safety within, he brings all your insane projections and the wild substitutions that you have placed outside you to the truth. Thus, he reverses the course of insanity and restores you to reason. So reversing the course of insanity simply means that we're not looking for it on the outside anymore because we know it's not out there. It's only inside, and I discover that by getting quiet, getting reflective, going within, studying, etc. Then, uh, this is not from the Course. We, we can't sell our souls, but we can sell our awareness of them. That is from the Course, but a, sort of a paraphrase of it, right? So that's always there. He has set the journey inward. Now, this is the good part. This is why you're here. What I mean... The, the reason that you are here is that you are on a journey inward. And you recognize that you are on a journey inward. And you recognize that all the outward journeys, none of them are going to work for you. It doesn't make any difference. Power, money, whatever it is, you can get whatever you want of that, and it's not going to prove very satisfactory. In the long run, it's not going to prove satisfactory. So let's reverse the process, and let's go in instead of going out. He has set the course inward to the truth you share. In the mad world outside you, nothing can sh be shared, but only substituted, and sharing and substitution have nothing in common reality. Within you, you love your brother with a perfect love. Within you. So even if you think that there's a brother out there that you don't love, <laughs> that's actually not true. In you, you do. All right. But you got to get in. You got to go in to find it. You can't go. It can't be out. You can't be in an outward form that you could possibly find that. All right. And then down to the boss. So we, the Course is trying to set, set the journey inward. Actually, the more you do this Course, this should be never ending. <laughs> but by never ending, I simply mean uh, it's, it's an alchemical process. It does end when you get home. But <laughs> as long as we're on the way in, right? It should it really become a process that gets deeper and deeper and deeper. <clears throat> by that I mean it needs to become a kind of an alchemy. And what we mean by an, an alchemy is that it's a, a cooking, a turning, a churning, a working around, but you're moving toward the truth. You're, you've, you've reversed the process so that it's not out, so you're not projecting onto the world. You're not saying how awful the world is. You're not finding problems with the world. You can find, you know, that's, turn on the news. <laughs> and a lot of the news is about, find, it's about pro problems in the world, right? All of it. And, pardon? All of it. All of it, yeah. And, and always finding a problems with the world. I mean, that's all, because otherwise there's no news. 
Oh, the the news uh, today. I uh, I found God today. Uh, <laughs> boring. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear about your 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 pleasant journey inside your inside. But uh, keep in mind what again what the inside is. The inside is your mind, right? So this is what I also mean about avoiding sleep walking. By uh, avoiding sleep walking, I mean you you. So that you are the studying, the reading, the meditating, the whatever it is, the reflection is taking you in, always in, to where the kingdom of heaven is, inside. So you sh it should work in such a way that you progressively see this more and more, which also means that you get quieter and, and just naturally more peaceful. So that the outside world does not does, does not take your peace of mind away from you. That the world does not change. The world continues to be insane, but you don't let the fact that the world is insane make you go insane, or you don't let the fact that say one one person, somebody that you work with or something, is insane. You don't let that take the peace of, of God away from you either. Nothing can take the peace of God. Could anything take the peace away? of God away from Jesus? No. Why? Because he knew who he was. And all the Course is asking us to do is, is to, to remember the truth of reality of who we are. And as we remember the truth of the reality of who we are, then there's nothing that can take the peace of God away from us either, including, I mean, in Jesus' case, it's going all the way to the cross. Now, that, that looks like something to be pretty fearful of, right? But even that, that's what he's doing on the cross, actually, is actually showing us that even this form of insanity, that the world, if the world can throw this kind of insanity at me. I'm reading a book right now uh, that's called uh, Famous Last Words, which is the last words that people said before they died that are recorded, and it's, it's like 700 pages, it's like 3,500 recordings of what different famous people said, and it was interesting reading what number of the people who were like burned at the stake said at the end, you know, or like the, the Joan of Arcs and all that. It was usually something pretty peaceful, you know. It wasn't, they weren't screaming out in, in, in terror. There was, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It was, you know, it was something that was just the opposite of what you would have, uh, that you would maybe have uh, thought. They weren't cursing the people that had done this to them. <laughs> Because at that point, they were going within. They weren't going without. <laughs> you know, they recognized that they were going home. They were getting really close to, to eternity at, at this point. The world may have done this really insane thing to their body. But it was just to the body. You've got to have your mic. It's, um, it's like that part in S Star Wars where um, Luke meets up with Darth Vader, and Darth Vader does the sword, and he just like... Lets himself go. Yeah, he says, actually says, cut, cut me down and I'll become more powerful than ever before, or something like that, right? But, but, but cutting him down, he, he now becomes, in, he's invisible, right? But it's in becoming invisible. I mean, no, there's no longer a him in the external sense of what it means. You know? He no longer has a form. Right? It's not having the form that gives him the strength. All right. Dolores, you got to have a mic. I heard recently that the Dalai Lama is saying he is not going to reincarnate. Good for him. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, it, and apparently it's making the Chinese crazy. Uh, yeah, there's got to be a reincarnation, right? Yeah. Because if there's no reincarnation, there's no Dalai Lama. Right, right, right. So he's going to end the end the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was hoping it would be that he was letting everybody know that you don't need me to get to the top. You don't need me to get through to the great spirit. Right. You know, there's a very interesting passage in the the Gospels where, prior to Jesus' uh, crucifixion. He says to the disciples, he says, it's important that I go away 
Because if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come unto you. And what I think he meant by that was the disciples were no doubt so enamored with him you know that, that that that's what they what they saw and they didn't realize that what he found they too could find but the only way to find it was to find it inside themselves and that they, they couldn't find it outside right by the way there's a there's a little similarity i think with what with ken on this and on and ken's uh leaving right uh, during the last few two three months of, of his being here, and people were very worried that you know he was leaving, and it was pretty, getting more and more obvious that uh, he was exiting. And uh, when someone would say something, he he, he kept saying, "I'm not going anywhere." <laughs> you know, the body obviously was getting ready to. To exit, but if you actually think about it, Ken had done it. You know, he'd actually he'd done it, and I don't want to go too far with this, but but actually, uh, I had heard <laughs> that he was sort of finished. I mean, with with this world, with you know, he'd kind of uh, done it. I mean, he 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 even completed the commentary on the text and and the word. It, everything. You know, he didn't finish the book on Freud. <laughs> but uh, my God, what? Think about what he did. But what he did first, it's very interesting what he did first. The first thing he did was he went within. Right? When I first met Ken, uh, actually, it's sort of interesting when it was because it was 40 years ago uh, in April, so this next month. And, and, just uh, four or five blocks from right where we are right now, uh, on 17th Street, just off Park Avenue. And prior to that, he was going to become a monk, right before he found the Course in Miracles. So, uh, and you've heard me say in the past that when going into his room was like going into this most Spartan thing. There was nothing there. Except the course and the Bible and uh, you know a few things you know necessary for the maintenance of life, but only the barest uh, kind of minimum. But by going within, look what he brought out. Right? I mean the the, the dedication, the, the the commitment, the the production of thirty six books, uh, hundred and some odd CD albums. Uh, I mean uh, this whole. He, he just, <clears throat> he went in, he found it, he came in, and he told us about it, right? And then there was, and then left. Could have done more, but had really done so much in that process. And this, it's really the same for us, too. We, 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 we go in, and that's where the real creativity is. The real, crea real creativity begins to come out, you know, and maybe the poetry or music or, Whatever it is, but first there's got to be that inward turning before the outward can begin to uh, to appear as well. But never got caught in that. Uh, I think it's interesting. A couple of things. Uh, he didn't get caught in the world. Let me just. Ken never endorsed anybody's book, right? But. He never asked anybody to endorse his, <laughs> right? He didn't. He never asked for it. He never had a book published by a major publisher. But <laughs> I know that Penguin and Tarcher came after him and asked him, <clears throat> you know, if they could publish his works. And he told me once that he had actually was sort of entertaining the idea, <laughs> but he didn't go for it, right? So it, it was it was never about playing that game of the world's game. You know, the world's game is you get endorsements. Right? And and you and you trade each other for endorsements. <laughs> you know, I mean that's kind of the way it gets played, right? But he wouldn't do it. 
Just, just get to the truth. Let's just do the truth. Let's just go to that. You know, let's not don't come up with the world's version of what it looks like in terms of form. We'll just go to what what it really says. That's that's the thing that really makes. That's what really matters. Well, let's go back to this because this is going in the same direction. Okay. Um, so in the middle of ten, he has set the the course inward to the truth. You share. In the mad world outside you, nothing can be shared, but only substituted in sharing and substitution. Within yourself, you love your brother with the perfect love. I think I read that before the break. Let's go to 11. Um, and actually go down to the bottom of 11. Whom God has called should hear no substitutes. It's a matter of hearing. It's a matter of what are we listening to? Are we listening to the world? Are we listening to the, what the world is saying? You know, do it this way. You know, get on Oprah. Uh, do, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever it is that you got to do. Play the game. Their call is but an echo of the original air that shattered heaven. And what became a peace in those who heard? Top of 12. Return with me to heaven, walking together with your brother out of this world and through another, to the loveliness and the joy the other holds within. Would you still, would you still further weaken and break apart what is already broken and hopeless? Is it here that you would look for happiness in the outside? In the world. Now, no, notice the next line. I, whenever I bold cap underline, we're really <laughs> want to emphasize. Right? Nothing the world believes is true. You believe that? <laughs> Nothing the world believes is true. In so far as it's outside of you, and heaven is inside you, and heaven is not. A, a visible thing. Right. But let's go back to this. Nothing the world believes is true. It is a place whose purpose is to be a home where those who claim they do not know themselves can come to question what it is they are and they will come again until the time atonement is accepted. Now that's an interesting. That implies reincarnation there, right? All right? Well, I sh I sh yeah, you're right. We, we should hope that um, that he would know that. I mean, we do regard him as being. If 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 you look at the the list of the 100, they actually grade these 100 top spiritual leaders in the world. And guess who's on the top of the list? The Dalai Lama, right? Of course, he would be up at the top of the list, right? And wouldn't we expect that those who get to the top of the list would graduate? <laughs> uh, magna cum laude <laughs> <I mean, laughs> in other words they really really get it right I mean the idea is to really get it right once and for all so we don't have to continue to really play this silly game and it, it's a silly game whatever the game is whatever the game whether it's a political game or a power game or a money game or a family game or a uh, there was a hand. Well, okay. You know, Bill Thetford knew that he had become free. He actually passed on um, the 4th of July in just a few days before he passed away. You know, he um, just, you know, said to, uh, to Judith, I am free. He started to, you know, kind of dance. I'm free. I feel no weight. I am absolutely free. And uh, he transitioned, you know, he, uh, he passed away on the 4th of July. Yeah. You know, so it was freedom. Yeah. And, um, you know, he just knew. Bill did. It was wonderful. Uh, I often thought that Bill was perhaps the first to, to get the course. I mean, to really, really get the course. But, you know, I, I would be difficult to say that for sure because Ken was right there with him in that, in that process. So it's not really a matter of, uh, of grading the, the thing. Uh, but he said, it, I'm, I'm all worked out. I mean, he literally said, it's, it's all worked out. He said, I, I don't have any relationships that, uh, that are unfinished. Oh, yeah, they were holy. I don't have any unfinished business. 
And I mean, my God, what a way to go, right? He also went instantaneously. Right? He went just exactly like that. Right? There was a doctor who was standing in the yard next. Uh, Bill was starting off for a walk. And uh, there was a doctor who happened to be standing in the yard next to where Bill was starting to walk from. And he saw Bill die. And Bill just went <laughs> like that. And the doctor said, if you have a heart attack and you're having a heart attack, you will go like this. I mean, you will, you know, you will, uh, 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 you will, right? But he didn't do that. He just, the life just went out of his body. And it just, right down. I mean, his heart, he said it literally blew apart. Just blew up. <laughs> so within a second, uh, uh, he was gone. Kind of a good way to go, right? Judy also saw him die. <laughs> she was um, backing her car out of the driveway and saw him in the rearview mirror. Right? That happened. But I really think it's 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 interesting that we kind of got onto this. So let me. I think they all completed the course, Helen included. Helen and Bill, and uh, and it's wonderful that the the originators of the course would have completed the course, right? Now, the one that had the most trouble with it was Helen, uh, being the most resistant and, and the easiest to fall into judgment. But I also knew Helen, and I never experienced her being judgmental. I always experienced her as being incredibly loving. She was incredibly loving to me. She was like a, a really good mom in the best sense of what, I knew that side existed because Bill and Judy told me it existed, but I didn't personally witness that part of her, right? Neither did, uh, was she that way in public, in, in private, <laughs> you know, she could be that way. But, but Ken was convinced that, um, well, I probably have told you this, but just real quickly for those who haven't heard, that her last day, um, she was in the hospital, and Bill and Louie, who Helen's husband, were, were not Bill, uh, Ken and Louie were with her. And the nurses said that they thought that she would live through the night, go home. They left, and Ken said the moment he came into his apartment door, the phone was ringing, <laughs> uh, that she had gone. She went home. And Jesus had told her that uh, he would come get her. And Ken said when he walked back into the room, she had the most beautiful, radiant smile on her face. Right? And he was just absolutely convinced that Jesus came and got her, just like he said he would. Right? So she kind of, it, they, but they all, you know, it just completed this process. And, and that's good news for us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's good news for us to know that we can complete this process too. We've got to have this. You got to have the commitment to doing it. And we're going to get into that here, either a little bit later or next time. Okay, down at the bottom of twelve. Or would you prefer to heal what has been broken and join in making whole what has been ravaged by separation and disease onto? Finally, two on page 13. Does not a world that seems quite real arise in dreams? Yet think what this world is. It is clearly not the world you saw before you slept. Rather, it is a distortion of the world planned solely around your proje our projections, is what it should say, right? In our dreams, we arrange everything. And in the dreaming of this world, we arrange everything. Of course, as dreams are perceptual tenter transoms in which you literally scream, I want it thus. <laughs> and thus it seems, I have to say, but this is a little aside, completely an aside, but uh, the really wonderful thing happened a few days ago. Um, I always wake up very early and much earlier than my wife does. And um, I, I just, I kind of like all, kind of like to lay there for a half hour, sort of transitioning in a very gentle 
way, no alarm clock or anything like that. So one day this past week, and my wife has this tendency to talk in her sleep, right? So I'm awake and I'm laying there, and all of a sudden she said, how beautiful. I went, my God, honey. I mean, she didn't hear me. I mean, I didn't. isn't that wonderful? I mean, that someone would say, how beautiful. In this book that I'm reading about uh, last words, three of the people so far that I've come across said one word or two words for the last words was, good morning. <laughs> Isn't that a great last word? Good morning? Who are they saying good morning to? <laughs> But it's, it's like they're waking up. You know, the, the dream is, 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 is ending. And they're, they're wherever, whatever that means. To God knows what, literally God knows <laughs> what somebody saying good morning would mean. But it's a wonderful thought that that would happen, right? All right. Let, speaking of which, let's just real quick, let's jump up to what page is it that's got the George Sanders on it? Uh, 24, I think it is. Okay, suicide. We'll come back to 13 in a minute, but seeing how we got to this topic. 22, 21 and 22. Um, Patrick asked me about suicide um, a few a little while back. So let's talk about it for a minute. Um, first of all, I have a great deal of sympathy for people who, who take their own lives, uh, in good part because obviously they have a lot of difficulty with, in trying to live in this world. Uh, they, they see the non-reality of it uh, very often. But again, it would depend on why one commits uh, suicide. By that I mean... Um, do they do it out of anger as, as an attack? Sometimes it can be done out of anger as an attack. It could be, I'm going to show you, you I'm going to make you feel guilty for the rest of your life for what you did to me, you know, which is a, not a very nice thing to, to do. Uh, there are others who do it simply because they sort of just get tired of it. George Sanders is one. Some of you know who George Sanders was? Uh, George Sanders was a, a British actor. Uh, he died in 1972, so only the older of us remember who George Sanders was. <laughs> but he won an Academy Award. If you saw him on a film, you would you would you would recognize he had won an Academy Award for All About Eve. And look on the top of 22, what he said: "Dear world, I am leaving you because I am bored. I am leaving you with your worries in this sweet cesspool." Good luck. <laughs> he had been married four times, once to Zsa Zsa Gabor, by the way. And uh, he just had had it. <laughs> no judgments involved. <laughs> um, but that could happen. I mean, that, that could be just, you, you, if you, I, and I've heard Ken say this too, that you know, if you take this course really seriously, and you see how insane the world is, and, and you see how mad the ego is. You know, it could it could get you to the point where you where you're going to say, well, why bother? I mean, why not leave? I mean, why not exit? Why not get the heck out of here? You know, and there are people who have done it just for that for that very reason. There's a problem with that. Uh, the, the major problem with that is that the one thing that you cannot leave, which does not die, is your mind, right? So the Course also says that what we're doing here in this world is we're trying to remember home, we're trying to awaken again. The idea is to awaken. The idea is to graduate, just like the Dalai Lama is, you know, done with it, right? So, but... In order to do that, you've got to learn how to do that. You know, you, you, you exit by becoming the Son of God, who does not need to return. 
All right, or the daughter of God, if you prefer it. This isn't a matter of sex. <clears throat> but we, we, if this is a school, I do not know one single mystical esoteric tradition that doesn't say this is a school. Every one of them says this is a school. The Course says the body is a learning device. It says time is a learning device. So we're in the world, in a body, in time. The, bo the school is the is uh, the, the world is a school, and it's not a fun school because a lot of times it's it's it looks kind of like a prison. So really, the question is, how do you get out of prison? All right. <clears throat> There's a couple of reasons. You, you one suicide could mean that you're you're going to escape prison, right? But there's a better way, and that's to get out for good behavior. <laughs> uh, to get paroled <laughs> for good, <laughs> rather than uh, trying to find some sort of other kind of exit for the process. Yes, uh, Eric. Um, I wonder if I, I always have in my imagination that when somebody is committing suicide, um, you know, the ego is, say, is saying, and, and the person is seeing themselves as the ego, present, the ego presenting itself as who I am, saying, your life is hell, and it's never going to get better. And, and then it's actually maybe something other than the ego that actually says, I'm out of here. Hmm. I don't know. There's another possibility, of course, for suicide, which I, I think that we can have a lot of sympathy for. I think I told you about this one case um, where life really is hell in the sense of uh, I, I had was doing counseling once on the phone with a woman who um, was just in constant pain and she said she was there, there was never a moment in 24 hours out of a day that she was not in pain this was something to do with her back her back was just constantly and it couldn't be fixed she'd gone to all kinds of doctors, etc., and um, she was just constantly in pain. And then about two or three months after we had this counseling session on the phone, I got a, a phone call from a fellow who said, um, would I please take his wife's name off of my mailing list for the magazine? And I said, sure. And I said, well, why? <laughs> he said, well, and I didn't know it was this woman. He said, well, she killed herself. And then I remembered that I'd had this conversation with her. And, and I, in cases like that, you know, I have a, you know, a friend who's a, a doctor that helps uh, for the geriatrics. And you know, his point is, it's really insane some of the things that we do to try to keep people alive uh, when it's very clear that they're terminal and that they're not going. Is, is it, where's, where's, the, where's the sanity? in keeping somebody in, in pain who we know uh, is that it can't be turned around sort of situation, right? So the best thing in the world to do is to, to love them out <laughs> in the most gentle uh, process possible. And there, of course, as you know, that varies by state by state in the United States. And there are other countries of the world where, like in, I guess, in Holland or in the Netherlands, you can, you, you can elect to, to go uh, through some sort of gentle some gentle process. But the fact remains, too, that if we, can, if we can figure out, if we can learn the lesson that we need to learn, then that's really what we need to do. You know, that's the first step to go out peacefully in that sense. So that's what we should really try to do. Right. All right, let's go back up, to, uh, not without a microphone. Uh, oh, you got two. Um, this word, uh, board, hit me because uh, I signed up to participate in Osho's 21-day meditation challenge, which started three days ago. So we're on day three. And for those of you who don't know who Osho is, I don't know a lot about him, but he was this Indian mystic that died some time back that was... 1990. Yeah, very, very much awakened. And in today's meditation, he, he was helping teach that meditation has nothing to do with concentration. It has everything to do with awareness. So it's about being still and being aware. And he said, the reason we meditate too is to walk through boredom. And boredom could be associated with guilt. 
And when he said that, it rang a bell. I started thinking about what the Course is teaching too. So we need to, it, it's a, it made me think about that, boredom being associated with guilt. And then he went to say, the reason we sit to become aware is to walk through these blockages of boredom. Mm-hmm. And I, it's just everything the Course is saying and another principle, I really, really find it comforting. Another thing too about doing the, doing work like the Course work is, and as I said, as, a, as, a, as an alchemical kind of process, and the, the thing about sleepwalking through life, is that the more you do this, you're not sleepwalking. Because you are becoming more aware. And, and more aware and more aware that the, you should find, as you do this work, that you, this, you're becoming more aware and more aware and more aware. Which really means that the more aware that you become, the less distracted you should be by the insanity of the world. You see it, but you also know very clearly that you can elect not to participate in it. You, know, you, you can't help but notice that it's there, but it does not affect you. You don't go around cursing it and damning it and getting upset about it and projecting onto it. That's just adding on, that's adding on to the insanity of the world, but then stepping away from it. Right? So that's, the, that's where this course is going. More and more and more and more and more and more, and more aware all the time. Right? Interestingly, the word is aware, it's not conscious. Sometimes people also becoming more conscious. Uh, but in terms of the Course in Miracles, the way conscious is used, it really means uh, subject object and sort of outside. You know, So we're not talking about outside consciousness. We're talking about inner awareness. Right. And let's try to go back to 13 and do a little bit more before we come to our second break here. Bottom of 13, so dreams show you you have the power to make a world as you would have it be, and that because you want it, you see it. And while you see it, you do not doubt that it is real. Yet here is a world clearly within your mind that seems to be outside. That's again, this projection makes perception. And that's one of the things you should become really, if you're seeing that projection makes perception. That's why if you, if you start to get upset, then one of the things, you, you stop immediately and say, why am I projecting this? I mean, why am I projecting insanity onto the world? Now, maybe somebody else is being insane and you're getting up, up, upset because they're upset. You're allowing their insanity to cause you to become more insane, which is just a, insane. Right? And going on to 14. So, as as, so we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. That's not the course. All right? It's just a, I don't know who said that originally, I don't take credit for it, but that's come, that we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. And that's what the course is going to help us to tell you. So you, say, you know, you're seeing it this way. You've chosen to see it this way. Why did you choose to see it this way? Why would you get caught up in politics, for example, right? Or whatever it is you get caught up in. And going on to 14. All your time is spent in dreaming. Think about that line. All your time is spent in dreaming. Your sleeping and your waking dreams have different form. That is all. Their content is the same. So you're driving your car. And what you're doing is you're, you're paying attention to what's going on, but you're daydreaming, right? You just, or you're riding the subway, and you're, and everybody else on the subway too. <laughs> you know, you're just kind of sitting there, staring off into space, daydreaming. Yeah? Do you know about Helen's subway experience? Oh, well, very briefly, I'll tell you about that. This was in 19, like, I want to say 38, uh, 1939, somewhere along, Helen was in her 20s at the time, right? And she was recently married to, to Louis. <clears throat> and they're riding a subway here in New York City. And she, Helen did not like to ride subway. She would take a taxi. Uh, sometimes they had to take a subway, especially in those early years before when, you know, but later on, no, no subways. <laughs> Unless there was just no other choice. (laughs) 
and she was watching um, uh, some, a couple of kids kind of fighting, and she was watching a, a boy that had chocolate on his hands, all over his, all, all kind of over his face, right? And she said, and she was watching a, a mother had this um, baby that was throwing up on her. <laughs> So the, the chocolate on the kid's face, and then she sees a, a little boy bend over and pick up a chewing gum off the floor oh. <laughs> of the subway <laughs> and put it in his mouth <laughs> and start chewing, right? And, and at the other end of the train, there's a, a couple of men are getting boisterously fighting with each other, right? And she's total disgust, right, with this whole situation. And, and she closes her eyes to get away from the whole thing. And bam, instantaneously, she's in this beautiful place, having this incredible mystical experience. And she said that she felt the greatest love, the deepest connection for every, every soul in that subway. That just all of a sudden, they were just gorgeous. I mean, they were just totally beautiful. Every, that's what I mean, that we inside we really do love each other. Right? Well, she had that experience about it, this connection. So she was really subject to these mystical experiences. This is way prior to the beginning of, of the Course, right? By the way, she told uh, her husband, Louis, about it, the, the mystical, it was a profound mystical experience, the way she describes it, right? And he says, oh, that's just a typical mystical experience, you know. It's just like, <laughs> yes, I've read about those, you know. <laughs> don't, 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 don't make anything out of it. <laughs> okay, we're time for a second break. Let's do a second break. Okay, let's go to bottom of uh, six, 16. Happy dream. I said before that the first change before dreams disappear, but disappear is that dreams of fear are changed to happy dreams. That is what the Holy Spirit does in the special relationship. He does not destroy it, nor snatch it away from you, but he does use it differently as a help to make his purpose real to you. The special relationship will remain not as a source of pain and guilt, but as a source of joy and freedom. It will not be for you alone, for therein lays its misery. As its unholiness kept it a thing apart, its holiness will become an offering to you. And then, let not the dream take hold to close your eyes. It is not strange that dreams can make a world that is is it not? It is not strange that dreams can make a world that is unreal. It is the wish to make it that is incredible. Now let's talk about this wish part a little bit. Um, this was something that Ken used to emphasize a great deal. <clears throat> it's not just that we got into this world and into this split in consciousness, into this kind of bro broken off situation. The really strange part is that we wanted to. The really strange part is that we chose to leave home, that we chose to come into this world, that we chose separation. So the real question then becomes one of why in the world did we choose this, right? Uh, and if you, you can go back to it's arrogance or it's, it's the, the need for independence. Uh, there's a strange paradox about the whole independence kind of thing, <clears throat> the need for a separate identity kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm working on the prodigal son story as a, as a chapter for a book. And we, we can probably all remember that, that great desire we had to the driver's license, the 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 first car, the the, the leaving home, the uh, uh, going away to another state, the uh, getting a job, the you know whatever whatever it was, the to be your own person kind of stuff, right? And the sort of the kind of the 
the liberation that, that seems to come. But of course, then there's also kinds of dangers that, that occur in there, the possibility for oh, things like trying out drugs or, or something, which can wind up getting one into a tremendous amount of, uh, of trouble. <clears throat> in the story of the pro uh, prodigal son, <clears throat> the father is very clearly God. And it's interesting that the, the, the first, I always said this is really interested in this story, what the father does not say. There's two things he does not say. The first thing he does not say is something that happens right in the beginning. When the son comes and asks for his inheritance, the father does not say, look, maybe we should talk this over. Is this really a good idea? I mean, you're going off like this. Uh, you know, uh, maybe you should invest your money. Uh, and <laughs> You know, the father doesn't. This, the third line in the parable of the, of the prodigal son is the father divided up his property and gave it to him. Right? So, in other words, we are not denied. And in fact, is, uh, God cannot stop us. <clears throat> uh, and the reason God can't to, to stop us because it would be a violation of free will. And uh, free will is one of the characteristics of divinity. So you can't stop, then if, if God stopped you, then you wouldn't have free will, right? So we got to, and we all know how, in the case of children, sometimes our, our own children, you know, how they may make some choices that we don't think of the wisest kind of choices when they go off and engage in whatever reckless be kind of behavior that they might uh, in, engage in, right? But... The father in the prodigal son story, <clears throat> as I said, is very clearly God. So he's, it's the wise father. Uh, the other thing the father does is what, when the boy comes home <laughs> and he says, I've, I've sinned against you before heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your, your son. Make me one of your, your servants. The father doesn't say a word about where he went or what he did. You know, it says, he doesn't say, that's right, you've been a very naughty boy. You know, but I'm a good guy, so I'll forgive you. You know, what? The father doesn't say a word about where he went or what he did. The only thing the father says is, is get a gold ringer, put it on his finger, get some sandals, put them on his feet, get a cloak, put it on him, you know, kill the padded calf, call the musicians, we're going to have a party. <laughs> because my son was lost, he's been found, he was dead, and he's come back to life again. That's the only thing that, the only thing that matters is that we come home. But choosing to do our father's will, what's the lesson for today? <laughs> Don? There is no will but God's. Is, so we're choosing to do our own will. It is your will. You don't want to, I mean, we, <laughs> you really don't want to do anything but what God wants you to do because God has the best intentions for you. As, as you were saying, uh, you know, really during the break, you know, you're part, you're part of God. God can't be making any mistakes. So we're just getting back in, in an alignment. So this would, the whole course could be understood as one of realigning the mind and getting, mi getting the mind back in line with the mind of God. So that we, we, the temptations may arise, but we see the temptation and we say, no, thank you. Um, we just, in fact, is you, you should actually get to the point where the mind is so well trained that the temptation is nothing more than a, a bleep. I mean, it, it's, it's nothing taken seriously. It, it might kind of appear, no, I could do that, but no, I'm not. I know that that's not a choice that, that I'm going to even. And then after a while, there are no temptations at all. You know, I mean, they, they should actually, you, you're just doing, you, you are so clearly hearing the voice for God, guiding your every step through this life process, that that's the only thing that you could possibly do. It's the only thing that you would want to do, right? Because there's no separation. But they begin this point about the will. That's the important thing. Why would you want to break, go off on your own and, and create an insane world? Let's go to the bottom of 17. John, may <coughs> oh, yes, of course. You talking about the part we're here, the, the wish, the choice, the desire, right. and the separation not being the problem. The, the issue is the decision or the choice or the wish to listen to the wrong voice. Right. Well, in Lesson 72, which was just a couple days ago, mm -hmm. I've never looked at the ego like this. It's almost like I, I've looked at it for the first time. It says, the ego's fundamental wish is to replace God. 
in fact, the ego is the physical embodiment of that wish. Right. So this is the physical embodiment of the wish to replace God with my I want it thus. Right. Yeah, very clear. Yep, and that's, a, that's the insanity, that's the dream. The dream is that it's possible to do that. Right. And what the, what the atonement is, the atonement is saying that never happened. That's why this whole world is a, an illusion or a fantasy that has absolutely no reality at all. And let's pass the mic back to Amy so that uh, Amy can share. Oh, what you were just saying struck me. Um, right to okay. your mouth. Yeah. Um, it's almost as if you're saying you can't do anything but lose. And I don't think that that's what it is. I think that we're bringing something more in our experience to the experience of God, but the way you expressed it, it felt as if, you know, what the hell, you're not going to be able to, to do anything but come back as a, as a loser, a prodigal son, and, and you know. So it's, no, I'm it, you're, you're, you're I, making I, it sound as if it's no, it's not worth the effort. You're sounding like of the, no, the actor. Yeah. What, what, I, I got this. Uh, so what you're actually saying is exactly the opposite of that. And so the actually the exact opposite of that was you can't help but win. And you, you you can't help but come home. You will come home. In the prodigal son story, he decides to go home. <clears throat> I think it's interesting. When he's down at the bottom of the pit eating corn with the pigs, and he has a revelatory experience. And the revelatory experience is I could Go home. Actually, the way it says it in the scriptures, it says, and when he came to himself, and when he came to himself, he said, so that means he's, he's been lost up to this point. If you go back again to the that Watkins review list, and you see how many people went through crash and burning experiences, they all, at some point, they came back to themselves. And when they came back to themselves, they started getting it right. They, they realized that there was no choice about doing it the right way because anything else is just hell. It's illusion. It's, it's fantasy. It's dreaming. Guido? Um, yeah, um, something different, if you don't mind. Um, I don't mind. Uh, thank you. Um, when you were talking earlier about that we really truly love each other, um, last week, in my, in my group, we were reading chapter 20, and there is a line to talking about relationships and holy relationships and unholy relationships, and he says something like, there's no order in relationships or something like that. I can't remember exactly. Order of difficulty. A difficulty, something like that, or, or, but I didn't really, so I went home and I started thinking about it in all my relationships. And if we really true love each other, th what makes the difference for me, is the level of the relationships that I have in this world. For instance, my, my family and my, and my mother, my brother, I do have them separate, like a special love for them. That is not the love that I would feel for you. Because you're a stranger to me in the sense. Mm -hmm. So if I'm reading the line correctly, it means that, and I guess that's what you were trying to tell me, that I could love everyone the same. Right. In reality, like, she gave birth to me. That's not the reason why we love each other. Because if I, if I was adopted, I would have never met that woman. So there would be no love for her. So right. therefore, the love is in the relationship mm -hmm. and in the communication that we have with each other. Right. So if I could learn to have that love in communication, with all of my brothers, then the idea that we all want is proven to me. Mm -hmm. So it's just the system of this world where we can only love the people what we gave birth to, you know, or the people that we are raised with, but not but that's not what that's not the source of love. Because if I was adopted, she wouldn't I would have never met that woman. No, I'm so that is a, a proof that it's not in the circumstances, but more in the relationship right. that we have with each other. Would you yeah. say it's, well, obviously I'm crazy or, or, or yes. I'm crazy, no. right? 
I mean, just because what it is, then my ego tells me that I should feel guilty for not loving her, for not having a special love for her, because she gave birth to me. That's what my ego tells me, yeah. that it's wrong for me not to love her more no, than no, anyone no. else. No, no, no. You know, the, the only difference there is that you have time and hi you have history, you have a story. I mean, you have, a, you have that kind of relationship, you know, and, and it's inevitable. You know, we, we, we do love everyone. But obviously, there are people that we spend a lot more time with from the very beginning in the case of your mother, right? So uh, it's inevitable that, that, that what the love they feel there, it's going, to be, it's going to have a different form. But that's all. It's still a Jesus form. didn't love Mary more than anybody else. I don't not. think he said, like, no. she's my mother and I love her more than any other disciples. Right. No, of course not. Okay. Thanks. And the fact that you, you spend more time with your mother and you've got a history with your mother doesn't mean that it's any more or less than anyone else. There's, again, there's no order or difficulty in miracles. Okay. Um, did I do the bottom of 17 yet? Heaven is sure. Let's do the bottom of 17. <clears throat> yet heaven is sure. This is no dream. Its coming means that you have chosen truth. And it has come because you have been willing to let your special relationships meet its conditions. In your relationship, the Holy Spirit has gently laid the real world, the world of happy dreams, from which awakening is so easy and so natural. That's the way it should be. I think that's like the good morning. Yeah. It's just an just a easy, natural process, right? For as you sleep and your waking dreams represent the same wish in your mind, so do the real world and the truth of heaven join in the will of God. It's all really one and the same thing. The dream of waking is easily transferred to its reality. For this dream reflects your will joined with the will of God. And what this will would have accomplished has never not been done. So it's already done. It's, it's already clear. The, the, the good news of this whole thing is this may seem strange, but it's still the case, that, that our whole experience at the moment <clears throat> is kind of like a backflash. <clears throat> and the truth of the, the reality is, it, it's over. Uh, you're already home. You're already with God. You're already in heaven. Uh, but you're having this dream that you are this individual with a, a name living in a place called New York with all these other strange characters running around outside that you have to, to deal with as a part of the, the seeming madness of, of this world. But it's still, a, it's still a dream in the same sense that your childhood seems like a dream at this point, doesn't it? I'm not sure it does. You know, uh, uh, Patrick? Yeah. I'd give the mic back to Patrick. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I was dreaming within a dream, but... Um, Might have been. <laughs> Or um, why, um, why have we had the wish for the separation? Yes. Well, I missed that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that that's the insane. That's what Ken was saying. You know, that's the really strange part. Why would we want to do this? Now, that that question comes up constantly, and I've answered it before. And, but I always preface it by saying that my answer is not satisfactory. Uh, because even if I can give you an, an answer, it's a redundant why question. So you'll say, why that? So I can give you an answer. So I can, I can say it comes out of arrogance. But the, where, the, where the hell did the arrogance come from? I mean, you know, why, 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 why would we have the arrogance anyhow, right? Or it came out of pride, you know. That's another word. That's the, the the fall, the need to for self-assertion, so to speak. But the point is that 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 is all a fantasy. That's all a part of the dream. Which again is why I know this is kind of heavy-duty metaphysics of the course, which which is why it actually never ever even happened, and why someday it will all disappear as though it never happened, because it never happened. Does that sound kind of, I know it sounds kind of twisted and backwards, but the truth is that's the way that it is. You, gotta, uh, you need the mic for that. Uh, Eric, one sec. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of 
uh, locked into the prodigal son story, this idea of um, how much more did he appreciate his father after mm. coming back after all this has happened and yes, he had yes, yes. screwed up or you know and, and all this and, and even even that he could have gone back at any time before that and the right. father's the father you know the father would been the same. Would have it, it, it didn't matter when it happened and if he had, right. if it had been years later it, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have mattered that right. but the appreciation the gratefulness to find something that this love that you think is lost is not lost. That's mm -hmm. the real beauty of the prodigal son story to me. Right. One of the things that I've noticed in, in this research that I'm doing on this uh, book about near-death experiences is that what happens when an atheist has a, a, a near-death experience or somebody who's, you know, and, and they don't see God or they don't experience heaven. Well, what's really interesting is that still universally, when they come back, they have a much deeper appreciation for life. And, and, and they tend to be more generous and, and, and outgoing and, and loving and sharing, more humanitarian, <laughs> you know, than, they, than they've ever been before, even though they, they might not have had the same sort of profound kind of mystical experience that introduced them to, quote, God. You know, whatever God is, God doesn't have a definition in that sense. All right, and uh, you've got a mic, so I guess yeah, you might as well um, use it. You know, when you asked that question, it made me think, and something just popped into my head that I felt like vocalizing. Um, you know, when the question, why did we wish to be outside of God or to be separate? You know, and then I started thinking about what the Course has to say about that, saying that it was a mad idea that we took seriously. So the mad idea, the idea outside of the sane world of God's thinking, taken seriously, became the wish. So it, I'm just thinking that, it, for my own clarification, that the, the mad idea taken seriously became the wish. It wasn't the wish first. The wish is the mad idea that we took seriously that projected this world. Good. Yeah. All right. Don, and then I want to direct, and then we'll go ahead. I just want to say I'm really glad to be here today, and this uh, reference of the prodigal son is really helpful. And particularly as this has gotten developed, um, the idea that upon returning to be appreciative or grateful of the father and to realize, you mean I could have done this long ago, like I, I didn't have to wait, I could have, you know, but what I came up with is in that process of leaving or separating that never happened, I get to know the love, the love of God. I get to mm. know God right. as God. If I never took that path, how I mean I, I would I couldn't sit here and speak to what that would look like because I'm here obviously, right. but it's as I sit here and know my own process as a as a prodigal son. I get to know the love that I am. Right. I get I get to know better yeah. the love that I carry and the meaning that it has and the depth. I mean I, I don't believe that I even have a concept of the depth of the love that I am. Right. But I'm starting to. Right. And and that's that's, that's the, the gift. Works. That's the way it works. Yeah. The French have a saying, uh, no matter what road you take, you'll, you'll, you'll get there. You know, so, <laughs> just a second. So we will, you know, we'll get there. The, the, only, the only thing about this is that as, as you begin to do the course, it should be that it's going to be, a, this journey through this life process is going to be less difficult. And you're going to have less, less trips and less falls and less struggles to, to deal with. Uh, because you're paying more and more attention to what the process is. So let's get Billy, and then I want to wrap this up in a bit, um, because I want to do it. We need a mic for Billy. Hello? Oh, yep. I just want to say, you know, like you said, the more you take this course, it seems like everything that's happened in my life relates to what you're teaching. Last night I was watching about... Um, 
a bear, I don't know if anybody saw it last night on TV, attacking a father and daughter. They were hiking through the glaciers. So as the bear was attacking the father, he suddenly looked in the eyes of the bear and saw the innocence. I mind when you teach about the baby, the bear had no like uh, hatred or anything. This was just no. natural to him. Yeah, right. Then he turned to attack the daughter, who suddenly was, you know, scared, you know, afraid for like, fear. Sure. And suddenly, a thing came over. She became calm and accepting what was happening. Mm. In other words, she felt like she was coming home. So nice. that's relating to the course. I'm always thinking, you know what I mean? That's the thing I bring up. I let it go. Thank you. By the way, have you noticed, like, uh, if you watch the nature shows, like when a lion is chasing, like, a gazelle or something, right? And they'll, the gazelle will, will do whatever thing can to, to get away from it. But the second that lion bites the neck, it's just, they let go. I mean, they, <laughs> there's kind of an acceptance of this, it's over. There's no more struggle anymore. You got the mic? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Use Thank it. Thank you. Um, I know we're speaking in metaphor, and maybe I, perhaps I'm being too literal here, but before the Big Bang, uh, there was what some people refer to as the great singularity. Now, how many billions or zillions of souls got together and said, we're going to bust out of here and do our own thing? I mean, who was the leader? I mean, how did it come about? That's, I don't get it. I don't either. <laughs> I mean, why would, why would, the, the, that's the same question that Patrick got. That's the same, that's that, that redundant question, you know. Why, you know, where, where did this uh, whole thing come from? Well, another teaching I was involved in with back in the 90s referred, uh, explained it by saying this is God's way of experiencing himself experientially through all of these souls. Right, but that, I don't, don't think that that quite fits the, the course. No. Yeah. Because then you're talking about something that's outside. Right. And right. The, the course keeps saying it's not outside you. It's, it's, it's something that's inside. It's, it's a mental thing. It's not an outside kind of thing at all. But you're right, it's pretty, the, the thing I was watching last night, I was talking about how there's hundreds of billions of stars in ours, yeah. just in our galaxy. What? <laughs> are hundreds of billions, and there's hundreds of billions of galaxies, and then, you know, it's just, <laughs> we're not going to start counting. No, but I, I, I'm just curious as to who led the revolt. Yeah. You know, that's all I want to know. I, I know who it was. You did. You did. <laughs> I'm flattered. Look, I, I want to I wanna do a... Pardon? It was just one. It was not like there were no right. aliens at one. It was one. And then they fragmented. The, the, it fragmented after, not at that moment. Yeah. It was just one. Yeah, yeah. There was a... It was one star. And then and after, was when it was all... All this there. fragmentation occurred. Yeah. They were not all together at the same time. I want to see the proof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, uh, out and go. Let's talk just a little bit about the solution here. Yeah. I normally lead a, like a five-minute meditation, and today I want me to do like a ten-minute meditation. So I want to move on to, to getting to that point. Um, but just one last, uh, this is on page 25. If you want to jump up for a second. So, you know, the question that you're asking is, uh, where, did the wish, where did the wish come from to, 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 to do all this? And now the, the opposite of that, the complete opposite of that, is that the Course says, well, where is the wish to undo this? You know, where is the desire to, to turn this whole thing around? At what point does that occur? Does that occur to the point of, of need? And at some point that has to, the, the reversal in thinking has to occur, but it also has to, to occur <clears throat> with the determination. I mean, so let's read on the bottom of 25, and the little willingness. The holy instant is the result of your determination to be holy. It is the answer. The desire and the willingness to let it come precede its coming. You prepare your mind for it only to the extent of recognizing that you want it above all else. It is not necessary that you do more. Indeed, it's not necessary. 
it is necessary that you realize you cannot do more. But see, what the important part is, is you want it above all else. Once you, you've got to really, we wanted to change it, now we've got to want to uncha- uh, undo it in order to be able to get home again, right? That's why, again, what you're doing here is that you're, you're restless with all the answers the world has given, and, and you know that it, it doesn't lie in any of those forms of material forms at all, right? So, but, <laughs> you've got to want to change this. You've, you've got to want to turn the process around and start going the other way until you really want to turn this around. Otherwise, you are sleepwalking. Otherwise, you're just walking through this dream, dreaming the dream. At some point, you can say, no, I really want to wake up. I really want to wake up. And then you... you what the Course is, is that the Holy Spirit will help you to, to wake up. But you've got to make the little willingness, just a, it's, just, it's just a little willingness. It's not a big willingness. You know, but there's got to be a little willingness to do it correctly. To, to, it, it's like, for example, here's a good example of being a little willing. Let's say someone confronts you with something that you've made a mistake with. <clears throat> right, and you start to defend yourself, and you realize that you're wrong. I mean, you're wrong to be defending yourself, because first of all, you're not going to learn anything in def- in, if you're defending yourself, right? Mm-hmm. So what you've got to have, you've got to have a little bit of willingness to know. Listen, listen, stop. Listen, don't don't get offended. Listen, why is this person saying this? Maybe there's some truth in this. Maybe I could actually learn something here. Maybe I can kind of give in and, 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 and recognize, no, this could help. This could be very helpful, right? That's why I remember the, the talk I did on uh, word fasting. <laughs> and when you do that, and when you see a word come out of your mouth, that kind of like, like the word upset. You say you're upset about something. Well, what you really, really, really need to look at is why in the world are you upset? I mean, why are you letting this just take your peace of mind away from you? Why would you let this? And, and that's the place to stop. You stop then. Stop there. Or another phrase but wouldn't have to be stop. It would be let it go. Just, just let it go. That's kind of what, just the sooner you can let it go, the better. This, the quicker you can get out of this defensive stuff, the more opportunity. But, but, so that's what you should be learning with the Course. You should be learning things like how the ego plays its silly tricks, and then you should be learning, I don't want to play this, this game, these silly ego games. It just You're tired of it. Right? Okay, let's, uh, let's see, we, we talked about five minutes worth of cards. Uh, by cards, I mean uh, anyone who, you got a card, and that was your message for today from The Course in Miracles. And you have to see what is appropriate for you. And let me have the mic, uh, unless you want to read your card. Sure. All right, well. Um, it cannot be hard. It cannot be that it is hard to do the task that Christ appointed you to do, since it is he who is doing it for you. That's like with the little willingness. You know, as I just got through saying, that, you know, the moment that you get it, you demonstrate the willingness to, to undo it, and then the Holy Spirit helps you to undo it. Safety is the complete relinqu- relinquishment of attack. Okay. Safety is the complete relinquishment of attack. You learn first that having <clears throat> rests on giving and not on getting. Right. May I over this way? I could hear Patrick. I just read this the other day as well. Um, Exempt no one from your love, or you will be hiding a dark place in your mind where the Holy Spirit is not welcome. And thus, you will exempt yourself from his healing power. For by not offering total love, you will not be healed completely. 
Every once in a while we think, well, I can forgive everyone, except. <laughs> except there's this one idiot. Right? So you got to go all the way with this. All right? Michael? The Holy Spirit teaches that you always meet yourself and the encounter is holy because you are. You always meet yourself. Anybody else on this side or the back that way? Jane? In quietness are all things answered, and is every problem quietly resolved? See, that's what we get down to eventually. You know, the, the quiet peace comes to the, the quiet mind. Go ahead. Heaven and earth shall pass away means that they will not continue to exist as separate states. Right. Which really means that all, all there is is heaven. But it doesn't look that way. Uh, Eric and then Shanti. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to put forth the idea that um, it's really desire. And it's really desire to think, see things differently because the way I'm seeing things doesn't work. Uh, and my card says, what is heaven but a song of gratitude and, and love and praise by everything created to the source of its creation? Okay. Um, here, hon. You got you to use this. Can I? Come here a minute. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think you all ought to know uh, <laughs> that between now and the time we meet again, on actually April Fool's Day, this lady becomes 88 years old. Oh, gosh, here, I've got the mic. Well, I thought I could do this without you. No, you can't. You can't. I didn't mean you. I no, you can't. <laughs> it takes great learning to understand that all things, events, encounters, and circumstances are helpful. It takes great learning. Okay, enjoy it. <laughs> Speaking about Shanti's age sort of reminds me of a, a, a little joke as a minister is preaching and... Uh, he says something about we have to forgive everybody, and he says, there's, there's, is there anybody in this room that there's nobody they haven't forgiven? And this 88-year-old woman raises her hand, and he says, well, how is it? Come up here and tell the congregation how it is that there's no one that you have to forgive. She comes up and she says, I outlive the son of bitches. <laughs> Let's go to a meditation now. <clears throat> uh, as I said, the meditation is uh, usually five, much more like seven or eight minutes a day. And uh, what I've been doing lately is choosing a meditation <clears throat> that would have come be one of the lessons that have come out of uh, the session leading up to this session. So something during the past week or two, if you've been doing the <clears throat> the workbook, this would have been like uh, Monday or something of last week, somewhere along in that, that area, all right? So if you would, um, close your eyes and uh, get comfortable and relax. And just be very, very present. <clears throat> Love holds no grievances. You who were created by love like itself can hold no grievances and know yourself. To hold a grievance is to forget who you are. To hold a grievance is to see yourself as a body. To hold a grievance is to let the ego rule your mind and condemn the body to death. 
Perhaps you do not yet fully realize just what holding grievances does to the mind. It seems to split you off from your source and make you unlike him. It makes you believe that he is like what you think you have become. For no one can conceive of his creator as unlike himself. Love holds no grievances. Shut off from yourself, which remains aware of its likeness to its creator. Yourself seems to sleep while the part of your mind that weaves illusions in its sleep appears to be awake. Can all this arise from holding grievances? Oh, yes. For he who holds grievances denies he was created by love, and his creator has become fearful to him in his dream of hate. Who can dream of hate and not fear God? Love holds no grievances. It is sure that those who hold grievances will re re define God in their own image as it is certain that God created them like himself and defined them as part of him. It is assured that those who hold grievances will suffer guilt as it is certain that those who forgive will find peace. It is assured that those who hold grievances will forget who they are as it is certain that those who forgive will remember. Love holds no grievances. Would you not be willing to relinquish your grievances if you believed all this were so? Perhaps you do not think you can let your grievances go. That, however, is simply a matter of motivation. Try to find how you would feel without them. If you succeed even by ever so little, there will never be a problem in motivation ever again. Love holds no grievances. Search for your mind for those against whom you hold what you regard as a major grievance. Some of these will be quite easy to find. Then think of the seeming minor grievances you hold against those you like and even think you love. It will quickly become apparent that there's no one against whom you do not cherish grievance of some sort. This has left you alone in all the universe in your perception of yourself. Love holds no grievances. Determine now to see all these people as friends. Say to them all, think of each one in turn as you do. I would see you as my friend, that I remember you are part of me and come to know myself. Try to think of yourself as completely at peace with everyone and everything safe in a world that protects you and loves you and that you love in return. Try to feel safety surrounding you, hovering over you, and holding you up. Try to believe, however briefly, that nothing can harm you in any way. Tell yourself, love holds no grievances. When I let all my grievances go, I will know I am perfectly safe. Whenever any thought of grievance arises against anyone, physically present or not, say to yourself, love holds no grievances. Let me not betray myself. Love holds no grievances. 
I would wake to myself by laying all my grievances aside and waking in Him. Love holds no grievances. We usually end by reading the from the back of the booklet. <coughs> get a copy myself. <coughs> it's often called the uh, the Lord's Prayer from A Course in Miracles because it's uh, sounds that way. Well, we do this together, <clears throat> stopping at the end of each uh, period and pausing at each comma. <coughs> Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect. The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. Just point out the, this line, the sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. That's kind of what we were talking about earlier. The sleep of forgetfulness would be like the sleepwalking through the world. And it's only our unwillingness to remember it that gets the problem. I, I want to offer a challenge <coughs> Yeah, I think with time you 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 will memorize it. Uh, it it, it kind of keeps saying. Uh, so uh, we'll see. I think it's uh, April twelfth, and then don't forget in May it's we had to switch. It's like the third, the first Sunday instead of the second to avoid falling on Mother's Day. And for anybody who's interested in going to uh, Saigon Market and having to buy tea with us. Uh, some of us will be doing that. So I will see you in a month. <clears throat> <clears throat>